Welcome to episode 19 of the Pop Anime Comics Lounge. My guest today is psychedelic superstar, OVW World Heavyweight Champion, Chris Silvio. But before we get into the interview, I'd like to remind everybody, please follow me on Twitter at Pop Anime Comics. And check out PopAnimeComics.com for articles regarding anime, comics, and pop culture. So without further hesitation, let's dive right into this interview. When were you first exposed to wrestling? Uh, man, pretty much when I came out of the womb. I've uh, There's never really ever been time in my life when I haven't been around wrestling. I had old, older brothers and was born in the mid-80s, which was like the biggest wrestling boom until the Attitude Era. So it was pretty hard to not know wrestling in those days. but yeah, I just always remember watching as long as I can remember. So what did you watch when you were growing up? Uh, my favorite show to watch was Saturday Night's Main Event. I remember I'd stay up as a real little kid. I'd try to stay up till like 9 or 10 whenever whenever the show came on, which for a 5-year-old kid is you know freaking crazy as it is. Um, but yeah, man, I watched all that. I watched all the WWF pay-per-views. I didn't really see too much WCW until like the early 90s. So I pretty much grew up on Savage and Hogan and Bret Hart, those guys. So when did you know that you wanted to become a professional wrestler? I didn't know. This is going to sound kind of crazy. I didn't know that you could do such a thing. Um, obviously, I watched these guys on TV, but I had no idea that just a normal, everyday person could like go to a school and become a wrestler or anything like that. i say around like maybe 97 or 98. Um, I, you know, I discovered some independent places and kind of heard there's a thing called a wrestling school where they'll teach you about wrestling. So I'd say from about the age of 13, I, I decided that's what I wanted to do. Where did you go to find a school to start training? Um, I kind of started ass backwards. There are, There's a few schools, I guess you could call them, in my area. Um, when I started, I started in Virginia, the mid-Atlantic area. And uh, it was weird. One of my buddies had a business card on his refrigerator for this uh, promoter named Travis. And uh, that's about the only positive thing I'll say about this guy. But uh, anyway, and it, it advertised like a wrestling school. So I called this guy up and set up the rings and worked out with a couple of their guys. It was like the most informal training possible. I think they showed me like two things over the course of several months. Um, then we started like like many people from that time. We uh, we used to put our own backyard wrestling shows on. So I, I learned most of like my early stuff just by trying what I saw on TV. And uh, from there, I trained with a, a group in Richmond for about six or seven months, and uh, you know, kind of learned some of the basics and fundamentals and stuff like that. So how old were you when you started to train? Almost seventeen. You couldn't get a license till you were 18 in Virginia, but I think you could start training at like 15 or 16. So yeah, I, was, I think it was just short of my uh, summer before my 17th birthday. And what did your training primarily consist of? To be honest, like in, in the wrestling industry, there are several reputable places to train. Um, I'd say maybe 10 or less in the country, but there are hundreds of places that really aren't necessarily qualified to train people. The way that I look at it, you got to be trained by somebody that has come up in a proven system or somebody that's been trained under somebody that knows some stuff and been somewhere. It's, it's a, a lot like the blind leading the blind with some, not to sound negative or anything like that, because there are a lot of good um, trainers on the independent circuit, but there's a lot of people that really didn't learn the business the right way that are just showing other people how to do stuff the wrong way. So it, it really kind of hurts. And the places I trained at uh, in Virginia prior to me just kind of taking over my own training. Um, some of those were a little bit similar. There, there were people that really hadn't been anywhere, no offense to them, just hadn't really been anywhere or done anything. Um, so it's kind of hard to, to teach somebody else when you know you don't have that much experience on your own. So you have a very unique style of speed with some technical wrestling strength, and you're yeah. a high flyer. How did you develop that technique and this style of wrestling? Well, as you guys know, I'm a bit of a badass. That's pretty much known the world over. The ultra-violent Chris Silvio is pretty damn good in the ring. You know, I just kind of pieced together a bunch of styles. I consider myself really a hybrid wrestler, meaning I don't work just high-flying. I don't work like a southern style wrestler or, or just a hardcore wrestler. I just kind of took elements from all these different genres and things that fit me and that I do particularly well 
and just kind of threw them in a big pot and uh, came out with something something that's pretty awesome. It's really no different than like music. Like uh, you know, I'm a big fan of uh, of music and cinema, as I've talked about on you know previous interviews. There's not really like one single genre of music that I'll just say, no, I'm only going to listen to rock and roll or I'm only going to listen to country music. The way I see it, there's there's good music and there's bad music. So it doesn't really matter what genre. If it's a good tune, I'll dig it. It's kind of the same with, with pro wrestling. You know, you can switch styles and have good things and bad things. But um, I just kind of try to combine um, everything I can and make it my own. So I definitely have a distinct style that I'd say nobody in the country is really, really doing in this day and age. So I, I kind of stand out because of that. And I, you know, I don't plan on changing that anytime soon. So when did you first really break into the wrestling business? I had my first match in March of 2002. Like I said, I'd done, at this point, I'd done probably a year or so of training off and on. March of 2002, I had my first match in Elizabeth City, North Carolina against a wrestler named Paradise, um, who went by Kamikaze Kid at the time. He's currently an associate producer at TNA Impact Wrestling, so shout out to James Long. I hope you were doing all right, my friend. But yeah, I had my first match in 2002. 2002 it was like some really crappy uh, YMCA in this small town in North Carolina, but it, it seemed like WrestleMania to me. Funny story is I'd ordered um, pro gear. I ordered my first set of tights. I, I went by the name Susio at the time. So I got these what I thought were real cool blue tights with Susio on the butt, and I ordered some kick pad, real nice, shiny, beautiful kick pads. I was ready to go. Well, something happened and it got delayed. So it was time for my first match and I didn't have gear. So the night before the show, I went out to a local sporting goods store and I was like, well, screw it. I'll get a singlet and I'll find something that resembles a kick pad. The only singlet they had was a youth extra small. Granted, I wasn't very large when I started wrestling. I, I was probably 125 pounds. But this singlet was so small before the match, Paradise literally had to pull the straps over my shoulders because I couldn't pull it up myself. Uh, and I got some really stupid like softball slide guards or something to look like kick pads it was a real mess but the match was pretty damn good for a first match so after your first match where'd you go from there and how'd you get booked for other matches this was a place that i i had been training at pretty regularly so they ran um fairly consistent consistently i'd say a show or two a month um but really what got me booked is um even when i started you know i didn't necessarily know a whole lot but I always knew how to stand out and engage the crowd. And I have a, even then, you know, I was the only person kind of working the style that I did, did that kind of mixes in, you know, all these different influences. So I, I started just getting noticed in the area just because I was different and the audience was reacting to me. So um, I just remember it was kind of small, small circle of people. Promoters will go to each other's shows. I just remember being approached after, you know, several shows by some promoter or another just saying, hey, I like what you did here. I like what you did with the crowd. You want to come work for me? So I pretty much bounced around that mid-Atlantic area for about seven, maybe seven years or so. And uh, we also ran our own promotion in Virginia called Richmond Lucha Libre. If you haven't uh, seen any of the stuff from RLL, it's pretty awesome. Look it up on YouTube. We did some really cool groundbreaking stuff. So yeah, I was around that scene. I helped promote my own company uh, we did very well. We actually used to outdraw the farm league team for the Atlanta Braves, the Richmond Braves. We used to kill them with our uh, with our gates. We were, we were running pretty pretty strong for a while. Um, then in uh, 07, I decided I wanted to come up and train at OVW and try to take my career to the next level. And it's uh, probably the best decision I ever made. Now, speaking of 2007, you came to OVW as well as DWC. DCW. Derby City Championship Wrestling, or Derby City Wrestling. Yeah. So how did you find both of these promotions? Um, DCW was kind of like the NXT to WWE. So the NXT concept, that's not a new concept. That's something they've been trying to develop for years. OVW did this back in 07. Basically, there was the uh, the main show, which was the guys that were under WWE developmental uh, contracts. And then they... Uh, they, they wanted to start a TV show for the guys that were not under contract to get them experience. And, uh, you know, the office in Stanford could take a look at some guys and say, all right, you're good enough to move up or whatever. Um, so that's kind of how that started. I want to say it, it was kind of short lived because in 2008, WWE severed their relationship with OVW, but uh, DCW had a pretty nice run. It was, it was some funny stuff, man. 
once I did uh, me and Paradise, we did Romeo and Juliet. We performed Romeo and Juliet live on TV, um, and he was Juliet, which if you know Paradise, that would make a lot of sense. It was pretty funny because we, we moved down here and we didn't you know have jobs. We were just working out and wrestling and eating peanut butter sandwiches and shit like that. And uh, we were watching – We I love sitcoms, like 90s sitcoms. I don't get to watch them near as much as I'd like to, but me and Paradise, that's one of the things we shared – we, you know, we would get seasons of like Full House, Different Strokes, mm-hmm. Family Matters, all that kind of stuff. And I always thought it was funny how in every single sitcom, there's the episode when the kid has to be in Romeo and Juliet, and they're nervous about having to kiss the boy or the girl and the thing. So I remember we were just sitting around drinking beer one day, and I was like, hey, wouldn't it be funny if we did that on wrestling? And uh, we showed it to Rip Rogers one day in class, and he laughed his ass off, and everyone else did. And he just came up to us, and he goes, uh, hey, can you do that on TV? Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, we ended up doing Romeo and Juliet. We also did some sock puppet shows, uh, some singing, some dancing, a lot of stuff like that, just you know, trying to entertain everybody. And it helped us, though. It got our foot in the door. And then once they saw how entertaining we are, they got to notice how, how good at wrestling we were, too. So in OVW in 2008, you were being tracked to win tag team titles. H- how did that come about? That was a big deal because I'd been there about a year and a half or so, and uh, that was kind of close to the time the WWE we severed their relationship with them and uh, we the DCW guys we basically had to step up and uh, carry the show we had to take over the business and make sure that the houses were drawing and stuff like that so a lot of us got opportunities that were you know we had to really scrape by you know in the old developmental system I can't remember exactly how it happened. We just had a few good matches, and one day uh, Danny Davis pulled us. I think this was actually the first conversation I had with Danny Davis the first like year and a half I was there. He pulled us into his office and said, hey, uh, we're going to do a tag team tournament on Thanksgiving Day. We're like, nobody's going to show up to wrestling on Thanksgiving Day. This guy's out of his mind. Um, and he said, yeah, we're going to do a tag team tournament. We're going to put you guys over. So we're uh, okay. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll be there. Um, but it turned out to draw pretty well, despite my claims. Uh, we had a packed house, and I think we wrestled four or five matches that night in the tournament. I want to say there was a cage involved. I think the main event, like the finals, was in a cage, and Paradise jumped from the top of the cage, which is like the highest cage in wrestling. That's not a – I'm not working. That's shoot. Look at an OVW cage match. You will not find a taller cage in professional wrestling. I'm damn sure not jumping off of that. But uh, he did, and we won the titles, and – it was cool. It just kind of felt like, you know, the work we'd put in got noticed. And it was one of the finer moments of my career, my early career. You know, winning the tag team titles really created a rivalry with Dirty Money and Scott Cardinal. How do you feel about that, you know, back and forth between your team and theirs? We, we had a couple. I think we had two really good matches. But the feud could have been way better than it was. It was kind of Somewhere along the way, like uh, Dirty Money is actually from the same area, the Mid-Atlantic area that we're from, so we'd known him previously before OBW. I, I don't really know what it was, but we just uh, we didn't really click too well with Scott Cardinal. So I guess you know when you when you don't really click well with somebody, when I mean, you go in there and try to have matches, it just you, you can't really get the the best results. So um, at that time, we all just you know didn't really get get along too well with one another and uh the matches i think suffered because of that if, if you got people out there going out for the sole purpose of having a good match it's very easy to have a good match but when there's other stuff involved it's kind of thrown to the wayside but should have been a lot better but we did have some a uh, couple good ones and so with ovw putting the tag team belts on you how did that affect you psychologically well, it meant we had to show up to more shows, which was cool because uh, I, I just wanted to get as much ring time as I could and wrestle pretty much every day. There were times when uh, when we would do between three and five bookings a week, which is pretty much unheard of on the independent level. I think it just kind of validated that we were as good as we thought we were. Um, I guess that's the best way to say it. How it affected us psychologically, we just it was good to know that, uh, that they gave us the opportunity, and I thought we did a pretty good job in that role. Now, in 2010, you competed in a variety of matches involving tag team championship belts, a bunch of different partners, including Fing and Raphael Constantine. How do you adapt to working in different teams? I've studied a lot. I've always loved tag team wrestling. So when I got into wrestling, I wanted to be a tag team wrestler. 
So I just studied, man. I just studied match after match, all these great teams. So it's a completely different art. That's one thing that I don't know if fans are really smart to. It's a completely different animal learning how to work as a singles wrestler versus a tag team wrestler. Because you find out what you, not only what to do to highlight yourself, but how to highlight partner and highlight your opponent. So it's, it's a fine art, tag team wrestling. And I just studied like anything else. You want to get good at it, you study and you practice. Rafael Constantine was my second second longest running part next paradise and he and i just clicked we worked with each other for the first time in dcw and he was super small i got him on you know a heavyweight training regimen and a diet and stuff but when i came in fang was no shit like 115 pounds or something like that just tiny and uh i was i don't know maybe i was about 155 when i came to ovw i I think I'd been lifting for about two or three years, so I was still putting on size. And when I found a small guy, it was cool because I was like, all right, we can do a bunch of stuff. We can do ranas and head scissors. I'm like, okay, good, because all those guys were monsters for the most part, and I didn't have anybody that I could really have a fast pace, quick match with. So I was excited to start working with him. So we always had real good matches together and became very good friends. So when the opportunity came for us to, to team up, it was awesome. He and I just clicked so, so well. I would recommend anybody watch watching this look up fighting spirit versus the elite or fang and sucio versus the elite uh, those were some of the best tag team matches of my career it was myself and rafael constantine against adam revolver and uh man beast mcnailer these matches were just you know that's how you do a good tag team wrestling match so they're really cool and uh, it was actually through those series of matches that I got noticed with uh, with Ring of Honor Wrestling and got some opportunities with them for uh, for quite a while. But it was all due to that feud that we had with the Elite. We were just having these awesome matches, and we knew how to work together so well. Now, to mention another one of your partners, Ryan Nemeth. Yes, Nemeth, the uh, brother of Dolph Ziggler. Nemeth is cool, man. That's my boy. He, uh, I think he did some a little bit of amateur wrestling in maybe high school or college. He played college rugby um he decided he wanted to get into the business around 2010 i believe and came and trained at ovw and uh, he was super green at the time because he hadn't been wrestling long um, but it, he, he's real cool and real funny and just kind of got along with everybody so he was definitely my toughest tag team partner um we had fun but he had literally zero experience so it was kind of some of it was kind of tough but it, it was a really good challenge for me because i could you know take somebody that has hardly no experience and, uh, you know, kind of cover up some of the areas that he was lacking and, you know, get the matches over and stuff like that. But Ryan always had a good attitude. He did his part. Um, and he's, uh, he's a hell of a performer and a funny guy too. Hot Young Briley. I actually gave him that name. He's credited me for that. Um, I used to call him that Hot Young Nemeth Kid. And um, when he went to NXT, he marketed himself as Hot Young Briley. I think his Twitter handle is still uh, Hot Young Briley. For rights to that name, he still owes me a six pack of beer and anywhere from five to five hundred dollars. So you just uh, give me a call when you get a chance, buddy. So to talk a little bit about how you got into singles wrestling, singles we were doing uh, we were doing the Fighting Spirit tag team, me and Rafael Constantine, and we had a, a really solid match at a Ring of Honor house show. And I was just trying to you know move to the next level of my career, and I kind of felt like we'd done all that we could at the time as a tag team. Um, so I had a bunch of ideas how I wanted to present myself and stand alone. Uh, and that's when I started portraying myself as uh, psychedelic superstar Chris Silvio. Kind of you saw um, that character then morphing into uh, you know my personality today. The thing about being a tag team wrestler for so long is you always have to count on, so on somebody else. And I'm always on time for things. I'm very organized. So it's kind of hard trying to keep up with someone else. Like, hey, you got to be here on this date. You got to do this. You know, it's a lot easier just to kind of look out for me. So I, I never really had the chance to have a good singles career because I'd always been in tag teams. So I, you know, I decided to kind of go on my own and um, developed a, you know, really cool uh, persona and started doing my best work once I, uh, once I did that. So it's definitely been a, been a fun ride. And I, I think every single year I get uh, better and better. And, you know, you just see different layers of Chris Silvio. So one of your big push with uh, your singles run was when you were going after the TV title. And when did you find out that you were going to be booked to go win that title? I didn't. It was a funny story. Um, Al Snow was uh, was booking at OVW. 
And I want to say this was either close to when TNA had their brief run as a developmental territory. It was either right before TNA came or right after they got there. One of the two. You know, I wanted to be seen as a single star and I was busting my ass and I was showing up every week having the best matches and adding something to my um, my entrance, adding s- more swag or just every week I came out just doing the most ridiculous stuff. Um, I had an awesome manager, Money Mo Green, and we would just, hey, this this week we're going to come out with a top hat and a monocle and we would just think of the craziest stuff just to kind of keep it fresh and I added like a dancing hula hoop girl and uh, a little person um, to the act. So basically it was something that kind of couldn't be denied. And every week I'd be, um, you know, I'd be in the office saying, okay, you ready to roll with us? You ready to put us on TV? Um, and I did like dark matches for like four months straight or something like that. And I was just beating my head against the wall. Cause it, it just seemed kind of like a big test. Um, but I went out there and I performed every week and then I, uh, I tore my shoulder. Um, I dislocated in my shoulder in a match in uh, Clarksville, Indiana. And this was on a Friday and TV tapes on Wednesday. So I was like kind of hoping I was in a dark match that week and I was just going to, because I didn't know how bad my shoulder was. I was just going to say something like, hey, uh, can you switch out? Maybe put someone else in a dark match. But I get there and uh, they're like, okay, you're going to win the TV title tonight. I go, oh, great. So I just separated my shoulder the week before and now I got to you know, wrestle for the TV title. And I'd worked so hard for this. Uh, it wasn't like I could say, well, no, I'm hurt or whatever. So I, I, I sucked it up and I wrestled on it for quite a while. Anybody that remembers those matches or if you want to go on YouTube or whatever and find them, the funny thing was you'll notice I used a lot of my entourage. Like I used Mo Green and Mary. Mary Jane, the hula hoop girl. I basically used them so much in the matches because I couldn't do anything with my left arm. So I had my finish I could hit. I had a few spots I could hit. But for the most part, um, I couldn't really raise my left arm. So if you see me like trying to raise the title over my head or something, it always looks goofy as hell because um, my, my shoulder wasn't working. But it eventually healed and I got most of the strength back. So today we're all good. Today we're about 95%. So speaking about Mo Green and Mary Jane, how did they come into your persona and into your stable, for lack of a better word? I wanted a manager. I've always thought managers were cool, and it would add a different element to my uh, my personality. And I don't think anybody else had a manager, so it would have immediately made me different. And uh, I asked Mo about it, and he wanted to do something else. Like he was like he very nicely declined my offer. He's like, no, I, I wanted to, I'm planning on working something with such and such. I can't remember who. And I said, okay, yeah, whatever. <clears throat> and we ended up at a house show together. And I go, hey, Mo, you want to come out with me tonight? He goes, yeah, sure. So we went out there and, man, we just instantly clicked. We instantly gelled. We had a great time. And he's like, okay, uh, hey, you still want a manager? I'm like, yeah, you got the job. And uh, I just, then I wanted, like, just stuff to really make my entrance as elaborate as possible. So I asked uh, a lady I knew that worked with like some uh, contortionists and dancers, like kind of like a vaudeville sideshow type of thing. She said, I wanted a tumbler. I wanted somebody to tumble, like do flips, cheerleader style. And I wanted somebody to hula hoop. I don't know why, but I just had a, I don't know if I had a crazy dream or, or what, or I got too drunk. I don't know what it was, but I thought this was a cool idea. And uh, anyway, she said, hey, I can get you a hula hooper and I'll bring her to the show. So I uh, entered Mary Jane. She came out with her hula hoop, and that was another one where the second we came out together, um, we just clicked, which I was, you know, more than happy about. And um, she and I are really, really good friends to this day. We just uh, always gelled out there. She didn't have any wrestling experience, knowledge, so I was just kind of told her, hey, stand here, do this, and do your part, and uh, she did a great job. So eventually you lost your television title. And then you began to feud with Cliff Compton and Jason Wayne. How did those feuds start? Cliff may be my favorite feud. I had a pretty killer feud this year with Eddie Diamond. But Cliff might be my favorite just because we had a lot of fun and uh, we, we did some cool matches. I can't remember how it started. Cliff was been away from OVW for a while, and he'd called me or texted me a few times kind of when he saw my act developing and 
just kind of said, hey, I think your shit's really good. We should work together sometime. And uh, I just kind of said the same thing. Yeah, man, I'd love to work with you. And we just left it at that. Then Cliff ends up back at OVW several months after that. And uh, we just kind of pitched to, to work together. And it had kind of a rocky start because we were both baby faces. So the audience was really split. And, you know, Cliff's very likable. I consider myself very likable. So audience, I think, was kind of confused. Then Cliff, you know, did something nefarious and turned heel. So once he got heat on him, it was pretty easy for us to sell the feud, and we had a really good thing going. The crowning achievement of that feud, I would think, is we damn near sold out a Saturday night special in three days. Something happened. I think like Rob Terry and Crimson were supposed to main event for the title, and something happened. I think Crimson hurt his knee or something. So that Wednesday, the Saturday night special is on Saturday. That Wednesday, we get informed that we're going to main event it, and they announced it on a Wednesday. It'll be Silvio versus Compton in the main event. Four days later, we damn near sold the place out. So that was a really cool thing that, uh, you know, our work was so good together that we could, you know, put all these asses in seats within three, four days notice. Um, Jason Wayne. Wayne was the best feud I had that never happened. It was a house show. Feud. Like we go all around the, the different loops that OVW ran and we just had these killer matches. And we only got to do, I think, one on, uh, on OVW TV or a Saturday night special. And they gave us like six minutes to do it. And I just remember being pissed because I wanted to show how, you know, how good Jason and I worked together. But yeah, we really kind of got shit on once they actually ran the angle. So I think we had a match or two on, on TV, and that was pretty much it. But uh, anybody that saw those house show matches, they were just they were so good. Wayne was a really, really good heel, and uh, you know I knew how to do my role very well. So we had, we had some really good stuff. Now, in 2014, you came back to OVW, and that year you won another tag team championship belt, and you won your second TV title. How do you feel about coming back and getting both those belts during that year? It was it was bittersweet. I had a lot of fun teaming up with Jamin Olivencia. He's a personal friend of mine, and the whole reason I wanted to come back into OVW is because Jamin and I have really never had uh, had the chance to work with one another. And I knew how good our matches could be. We were teaming up and we were kind of laying the groundwork to having some matches with each other. Just, you know, didn't didn't actually work out. And I went in a different direction and ended up feuding with uh, Mike Hayes for the TV title. And those are some of my favorite matches also. Um, anybody that doesn't know Mike Hayes, um, he's a really, really good talent. Um, he, he lost his, I want to say, his left leg in Operation Iraqi Freedom in 2006 and uh, just went through hell. Um, you know, he had skin grafts on over 40% of his body or something like that. Guy just went through hell to uh, just be able to rehabil rehabilitate himself and kind of learn how to function in life and work on a, you know, move around on a prosthetic leg, let alone learning how to wrestle on one. So I, I got a lot of respect for Mike for working as hard as he did and everything he's been through. Um, but he's another one, I think it's because we were, we were so friendly with one another, we were both eager to just go out and have a good match. And Mike had the trust in me that I wouldn't steer him wrong. He trusted me and we got to do a lot of stuff and uh, you know, have some really cool matches and we were having the best feud uh, in the company. Different Booker was booking and just decided the last minute that we're going to scrap this feud along with a bunch of other feuds. And in the long run, um, it wasn't you know the smartest decision because business there suffered for several months um, thereafter. So that's, that was pretty much the return. And then I, I took a, another hiatus after February that year and didn't wrestle uh, really in an OVW ring until Friday Night Fight on July 24th of this year. So to talk about this year, um, you received your first OVW heavyweight champion title shot. Yep, How did that first. come about? There was uh, OVW's Friday Night Fight, and uh, I was in the main event of this. <coughs> And I just needed a really, uh, I needed a really strong opponent. And uh, Eddie Diamond, um, somebody I've known for years and years, I actually trained him um, over a decade ago. I was his first wrestling trainer, and I knew we would have a really good match. So we ended up getting that booked for the main event, and uh, just kind of how things go with wrestling. Um, I ended up booked to win that match, and we uh, we had a hell of a match and an awesome uh, series after where we just beat the hell out of each other, but in such extraordinary fashion. We definitely had, uh, I think, I'd go as far as to say some of the best matches in OVW history and definitely some of the best matches of 2015. I wish there were a way, I wish they would kind of maybe promote a little bit more on YouTube and stuff like that. 
Um, so more eyes. You can see OVW's television show every week online or in the tri-state area. Um, but the Saturday night specials are just like kind of like a different animal. And really the only way to see it is to buy it on demand or to purchase the DVD. But, uh, you know, I'd like some of those matches to be on YouTube or something like that just so people can see, uh, you know, how good the work is out here right now. And I kind of consider myself almost like an underground legend. I've got so many loyal fans just from around the country and, uh, you know, in England and Japan and stuff like that. But, um, you know, right now I'm, I'm kind of more of a undiscovered free agent, I guess is the kind of way um, that you could look at it. But I do wish uh, OVW would kind of, you know, get some more platforms to where the fans can see the Saturday night special, even if they have one match on YouTube and they got to buy the rest to see the other, um, something like that. But uh, there's, we're just doing some really, really good work right now, and I urge any true pro wrestling fan to check it out. Really, you can rent it for 24 hours, I think, for 99 cents on demand on OBWrestling.com. So go back and check out some of the recent shows and some of the matches I have with Diamond. It only costs you a buck. You know, you get like 24 hours to watch it, so it's, it's a steal. Definitely want to check out Chris Silvio because he's pretty badass. So how did you feel going into this match? What, the uh, the title match? The first title DLC match? and then the I Quit match afterwards. Well, um, I was a little bit nervous because those matches are dangerous as hell. And uh, you do one thing the wrong way and, you know, you can mess yourself up. So I just wanted to make sure that the matches were going to be good. That's always my biggest concern. Um, whether I like the guy that I'm in the ring with or I hate the guy, you know, Eddie and I didn't always – get along and you can kind of see towards the later part of the of our feud we kind of mix like uh like oil and water but above everything else i want to have a good match every time out there and i want to give the fans their money's worth um i definitely kind of consider myself uh a people's champion in a way you know i bust my ass for the fans that that buy their ticket and anybody that's seen me work, whether it's in front of 20 people or 20,000 people, I'm going to give you a quality match. So that was really my main goal is I just wanted the TLC to be good. And, um, you know, the other match is the same thing. You got to make them different. So you have a TLC match. Well, how do you get bigger than tables, ladders, and chairs? How are we going to top that? Um, so we had an I quit match and we, you know, kind of took some even more violent, you know, violent things into that and, uh, and actually ended up topping the TLC match. Then we're booked in a in the ultraviolet death match just last month, our third match. And it was again, it was another situation of how the hell are we going to top what we did in those last two matches? But uh, I think we, you know, we kind of pulled the rabbit out of our asses and uh, just had really, really killer matches. And the fans really seem to be digging what we're doing. And uh, you know, the houses are, are going up every week, so the audience is definitely responded to the new uh, direction of OVW. It's, it's a brand new product with some, some really good guys on it. Um, I'm just proud and happy to kind of be leading the charge on it. I want people to know how good I am. I want people to know how good some of the guys here at OVW are because a lot of times it, I feel it kind of gets overlooked. Um, so I take pride in that. I take pride in being the champion and I take pride in kind of leading uh, leading the group and if I could be the spokesman for all of us and just say hey, open your eyes look what we're doing it's amazing you know I'll handle that uh, I'll handle that duty with pride so in all your years that you've been wrestling you have a favorite match that you've competed in I have a few uh, ones that come to mind myself in paradise had a 60 minute time limit draw with the mobile homers adam revolver and ted mcnail or babyface versus babyface match which a uh, babyface versus babyface tag match is one of the more difficult matches to put together um and what made ours very special is that we did that for an hour and after we'd wrestled for one hour um, the fans were chaining five more minutes, five more minutes, and I'm just so proud of that match because we, you know, we really did something special there and just clicked so well. Other favorite matches, myself versus Cliff Compton cage match, the one I mentioned earlier, that was a really fun match. Myself and Rafael Constantine against the Elite at Ring of Honor's Bluegrass Brawl, I think it was called. Um, we had a really sick match there. Um, I had a great match for Ring of Honor in Richmond, Virginia, where I got to headline in my hometown, um, which was, you know, a dream come true in a lot of ways. And uh, Paradise and I helped pack that place. We wrestled against this team called A1, Jeff Early and Zach Hilton, and just, you know, really, really killed it with them. 
And then I would say uh, some of my recent matches with Diamond. I wouldn't know which one to say first, maybe because uh, they were all so good. But uh, maybe the I Quit match. And July, I had a, a street fight against Sabu, a guy who I have nothing but respect for, somebody that I you know, grew up wanted to emulate in a lot of ways um and we just had a really really killer match this july and uh, that was a whole lot of fun so i think that pretty much rounds out my favorites and now before we get into promos do you have any advice for anybody who wants to go into the wrestling business yes have a backup plan get as much of an education as you can or learn to trade or something like that because uh, it's it's very hard i think people have a a misperception of wrestling that you show up, you wrestle on these shows and now you're making tons of money and you're famous and all that stuff. It's, it's not the way it works. It's very hard business to earn a comfortable living in. You really, really have to hustle and it takes a physical toll on your body. So the main thing to realize is that it could all be over tomorrow. Um, that's another reason why, you know, I wrestle every match I'm in as hard as I do, because, you know, I could get injured taking a body slam, you know, just land the wrong way and my career is over. Um, so it's, I think it's really important for guys to realize that how quickly all of this can be gone and just don't put all your eggs in one basket. Cause at the end of the day, you don't know what's going to happen. You know, you may get injured. You may not, you may get an opportunity with some of the bigger promotions. You may not. Um, so it's always good to have a contingency plan in the event that stuff doesn't go as, as planned. Also, the second biggest piece of advice I could give is, uh, train with somebody rep. All you're going to do is learn bad habits if you don't. And it's a lot easier to teach somebody from scratch than it is to break old habits. And so if you're listening and you're thinking about getting into wrestling first, make sure it's something you want to do. And it hurts bad. There's nothing fake about pro wrestling. You will get injured. You will be sore pretty much every day of your life. But if you're passionate enough about it, um, you know, then it's, it's something you can do. But just make sure you got that backup plan and trade with somebody good. I'll throw a few names out there. The uh, hustler Rip Rogers and Matt Capitelli at OVW. Um, Brutal Bob Evans in the Northeast. Les Thatcher, Lance Storm, Danny Cage at Monster Factory, very good trainer. Um, Team 3D, I don't know if they're, I know they're recently with WWE, so I don't know if they're taking sessions right now. Um, that's another very good school. Um, there may be a couple, uh, Seattle area, Buddy Wayne. Um, there may be a few I'm leaving out, but uh, if you're going to train somewhere, I highly recommend training with one of those places I just named. And finally, do you have anything you'd like to promote? Yeah, um, see me every single week on television. Um, if you're in the tri-state area, which is Kentucky, Indiana, and Ohio, um, we are on Ion TV. If you go to OVW's website and click TV, it'll tell you how to view the shows. I think we're on at uh, 11 a.m. on Saturday mornings and 10 p.m. on Saturday nights. They show a replay. Uh, most people tend to watch it at the 10 p.m. hour. Also, OVWrestling.com, you can stream these shows online for anywhere in the world for absolutely free um, so you can see what we do but I, I do urge you strongly um, just check out the product there's just some really talented guys and as I said earlier I'm just very happy to kind of be leading the charge right now for the new generation of OVW guys um, Saturday night specials are, are at the Davis Arena they are the first Saturday of every month we have one coming up October the 3rd where I'll, I'll be taking on uh, NWA talent Devin Driscoll for the heavyweight title. Um, it's going to be a really good card. Um, on Twitter, I'm always on Twitter. Uh, you can follow me at the Chris Silvio. I interact with all my fans. You know, even people that say dumb, wacky stuff, I still, uh, I'll still interact with you guys, and I always appreciate feedback from the fans. Um, so check me out on Twitter. Any bookings or podcasts, anything like that, um, you can uh, reference C Silvio Bookings at gmail.com. That's C S I L V I O Bookings at gmail.com. Uh, if you need to get a hold of me for merch or bookings or anything like that. That about covers the, uh, the promotions. Oh, also, I'm going to be, uh, this winter, I'll be uh, touring the UK for a better part of eight weeks. Um, so I do have some dates opened up. The scene's a little bit slower in the winter, um, so there's not as many uh, events running, but I still have some open dates. So any uh, UK promotions, get at me at uh, bookings at gmail.com. Thank you for listening to this week's podcast podcast and remember to subscribe to this podcast so it finds you and you don't find it and check out the facebook page pop anime comics for all updates regarding pop and this very podcast and while you wait for the next episode everybody have a great week